What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mad Blood. My name is Matt, and today I wanted to talk about kind of the rise and fall of the Rob Zombie Halloween movies, Halloween 1 and Halloween 2 from Rob Zombie, which came out in 2007 and 2009. Some of the most polarizing movies in the franchise, for sure, especially before the David Gordon Green trilogy came out. But these movies are so interesting to me in the franchise because... You see so many people with these movies who absolutely love these movies. They will go to their grave defending these movies. And then you have other people who love the Halloween franchise, but these movies are completely unwatchable for them. And I can understand both perspectives for sure. And we're going to talk about that today. Some of the kind of peaks and valleys of these two movies, the goods and the bads, the good characters, the great moments, the terrible moments, the moments where it's just like, I don't know what you were thinking, Rob Zombie. And just all that kind of stuff. And I will say right off the bat, I actually enjoy these movies. I like both of these movies, surprisingly. Um, there's a lot of things in both of these movies I think are very questionable. But for the most part, I actually do enjoy both of these movies. And I'm going to talk about, like I said, the goods and the bads. And a lot of the things that I enjoy with the movies. And then my criticisms, for sure, because... Neither of these two movies are flawless by any means, in my opinion. So we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. And just also like what Rob Zombie was going up against in the production for both of these movies, um, especially in H1 and uh, just everything that went into that. So Halloween 1 from Rob Zombie, of course. Going into this, people were like, okay, what is Rob Zombie going to do to a Halloween franchise? What's his imprint that he's going to make on this franchise? What's he going to do here, right? And with Halloween 1, Rob Zombie was kind of put into a little bit of, bit of a box and kind of had some rules and some things like, hey, you need to do this if we're going to let you make this movie in a sense. So there are some things in the, in the first Halloween movie from him that were kind of, you know, stuff that we had seen before, but obviously with his own little twist, his own little take on it for sure. So the opening of the movie in the sense, kind of the beginning of the first Halloween movie from 2007, the remake, I guess you could say, is clearly one of those things where people either can understand why it's, why it's there or they just find it completely unwatchable, kind of what I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of people that enjoy this first movie, but this opening, this whole like introduction to the Myers family is just something that turns them off so much that they cannot go back and rewatch this movie just because of this opening. But to me, there's so many things I understand about this opening I think are effective, but also there's so many things I think are wrong with this opening for sure. Now, of course, the opening to Halloween 1 and from 2007 wants to, I'm just going to say Halloween 1 from here on out. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know I'm not talking about 78, okay? So I'm just going to say H1 kind of essentially when I mention this movie in some way. So, but you know the opening here. It clearly wants to offend you in so many ways. It wants to make you just so uncomfortable in so many ways and just as uncomfortable as possible, really. And, you know, of course, a big part of that reason is to build up towards the story and what we see later on in the movie. And, of course, yes, it's disgusting. Yes, it's hard to watch. Yeah, it's kind of like a car crash that's almost too brutal to even look at at times. But there's something here just to be said about, you know, seeing what happens to young Michael Myers here and how he comes to be and what's going to be built up towards the rest of what we see with his character. Yes, it's disgusting. Like I said, yeah, it's hard to watch. Yeah, there's some moments here you're just like, Jesus, do people really talk about this in real life? But yes, there are some things. It's just clearly Rob Zombie had this idea to, okay, I'm going to try to offend the audience in a way. I'm going to throw ice water into their face in the beginning of this movie and let them kind of know what they're in for here. And this was a little bit different than kind of the formulaic way that Rob Zombie was kind of told that he had some, to include some things in this movie. This is definitely one of those things where it's like, okay, this is Rob Zombie's touch on the Halloween franchise right away. So the opening right there, some things that it does well towards building towards the rest of the movie, but also it's just like, did we had to, did we need to go there, you know, in certain ways, in certain moments, did we need to go there? Did that line need to be there? You know what I mean? That's up for debate. It probably still could have been just as effective with some of those things taken out. 
Um, but that's not Rob, what Rob Zombie's here for. He's not here to like try to appease necessarily to the most masses. I'm sure the Weinsteins obviously wanted him to, but still he wanted to make, you know, his idea of what this project should be. And the opening has such a big part of that. So also I got to say, you know, I think the real kind of, uh, the real thing to blame here, just the main thing that might've actually sent Michael Myers on this whole rampage, rampage after all was probably that terrible candy that the Myers neighbors gave to him. That just probably just sent this kid over the edge. You know what I mean? Like that's probably what happened here. Let's blame the neighbors actually for this entire story, okay? Not the family, not the fucked up childhood, not the trauma, not the bullying. The terrible candy that sent Michael Myers over the edge on that Halloween night. No, but, um, and just to kind of piggyback off of that opening, like it's undeniable in this movie that Rob Zombie sets out to make you feel something. There's nothing worse than going to see a movie and leaving that movie, whether it's a comedy, action movie, horror movie, thriller, whatever it is, and not feeling anything, really. That's the worst thing. You want to feel something. That's the whole point of it in a way. Scared, happy, sad excited, whatever, depressed, whatever it is, you know, you got to feel something. And it's undeniable that Rob Zombie does such a great job of having an, an idea of, I want the audience to feel this way. And then he does a pretty solid job making you feel that way. Um, and this movie just in general, just makes you feel something, you know, whether you like it or don't like it, this movie is very effective at making you feel something. And just to kind of, you know, talk about a little bit more that goes into the production of this movie. So I mentioned this for a second ago earlier, how difficult this movie was to make for Rob Zombie. And this is something that needs to be put into the back of your mind. If you don't know a lot about kind of the behind the scenes stuff with this movie and the second movie, is that this movie was a terrible experience for Rob Zombie to make. He had a three movie contract going into making this movie. And after making H1, he wanted out of his contract entirely. We'll talk about more of that in a moment. But um, but it was just a terrible experience working with the Weinsteins. He did say that, yes, like when they do say, I want to get a movie done, they do it and they're fast about it. He did like that. But the constant micromanaging, the constant phone calls about you guys are doing a shitty job. I hate everything. This is terrible. This is not going to work. You need to fire this person, this and that and this and that. Here's my input. You know, they, yeah, maybe might have had some good ideas on this needs to be changed, but the actual execution of it, you need to stay out of that. Let Rob Zombie, let the other part of the team handle that. They were just way too in, into it. And Rob Zombie has said a million times, this entire production for this movie was just a terrible experience all around. And we'll talk about that more in, in more detail in a in a minute. But um, also with Halloween 1, part of the goal here was to essentially reinvent Michael Myers. They felt like in this franchise, Michael Myers in general, and just kind of the tropes of the franchise had started to become too familiar for the audience, which kind of as a result made Michael Myers specifically less scary. So a big reason going into this movie was to kind of reinvent, come up with some new ideas for Michael Myers. And obviously a big part of that is Tyler Bane as Myers, who I really enjoy as Michael Myers in this movie. Yes, I love the other Myers in the franchise. Yes, I love the smaller Myers. That's a little bit more like normal looking, stalking around, creeping in the shadows, like a, you know, like a cat in the in the shadows, but this more menacing Myers not only was like so, you know, popular at this time in the 2000s when this movie came out, you know, we'd seen a similar version of other, you know, main antagonists like, you know, with Leatherface and with Jason in the 2009 remake and stuff like that, of course. And I really enjoy both of those movies. And this movie with Tyler Maine um, playing Michael Myers is is no different. Really enjoy uh, Tyler Maine's portrayal of Myers in this movie. He's just menacing, massive, aggressive, gritty, scary, and um, obviously a big part of that. Also is the mask in this movie, which I personally really like. I actually do. I really like the Myers mask in both of these movies. Yeah, there's some moments where I think the Myers mask is a little bit questionable at times, but overall... I do really like the Myers mask in this movie. I think it's incredible. I think it's a great take. 
Um, it just adds just enough that's new to the franchise, but also with a look that's kind of a little similar to what we've seen before. You know, it doesn't look weird or goofy, and it doesn't look like a direct replica of the original or anything like that. It's got its own new take on it, take on it but it's still scary and uh, it also fits the feel of Rob Zombie's movies too, which is great. And I think The Mask and Tyler Mann are just incredible in both of these movies, so he's got to get his flowers for sure. And obviously, one of the most controversial things in H1 is we get the origin of Michael Myers. And I know... So many people like myself gravitate towards making the audience think more about the villain. Come up with your own ideas of what's behind the villain. The origin of how this villain became, how Michael Myers became so evil. What's in his head? And yes, there's something to be said about maybe the layers were peeled back too much in this movie. But regardless, reinventing Michael Myers kind of putting a new trope and just kind of a new reinvention on the franchise is something that Rob Zombie clearly wanted to do and, you know, did a pretty good job of it in this movie. So obviously the origin story of Myers is one of the most controversial things in these two movies and one of the biggest parts of this movie for sure. And, um, you know, we get that whole, okay, what is Myers? You know, was he born evil just straight out of the womb? You know, what was he? And in this movie, clearly they wanted to just portray that Myers in these two movies is this perfect storm of interior and exterior factors basically leading to this unbelievable evil mixed up with a person who's also massive, who can cause some major destruction making this crazy combination of evil, right? So that's um, that's something to be said there. There's also a part of me when I watch these movies that thinks to myself like, damn, imagine if we could have gotten a Tyler Mayne, Michael Myers, without all of kind of the backstory stuff, without seeing him grow up, without seeing young Myers' face and things like that. I don't know. Because when I watch these two movies, there is something that I'm a little bit mixed on later on when you don't really ever see Michael's face later on in the movie, he's pretty much always covered by either his hair or his mask, but you still always kind of think in the back of your mind about the young Myers face behind that mask. Imagine a movie where it's Tyler Mayne playing it, but you never ever saw Michael's face. There's something like to me that just seems so eerie and creepy. And I, that would have been cool too. I would have really, really enjoyed that. But and here, of course, the intro, us following Young Myers, is kind of a long process, right? Like, we're following, we don't actually get to adult Michael Myers until 35 minutes into this movie. Whereas in the original, we got to adult Myers about eight minutes into the original movie. So, whether you love that, whether you hate that, you know, I think it was probably a little bit too long. Um, you know, the kid stuff was probably a little bit drawn out for me, but... 35 minutes, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot you have to get into to building this character who's supposed to be this unspeakable evil. I mean, you got to put some time into that. So I understand, you know, why they did put so much time into it, showing the home life, the school life, the combination of everything, his mom's, you know, her work, her life, her trauma, all the issues. You know, they got to blend all of that, and that takes time, and I totally understand that, so... Another thing I really, really enjoy about both of these movies is they have that unique, like, 2000s sound design to them. You know what I mean? If you grew up watching horror movies in the 2000s like I did, <clears throat> you probably kind of know what I'm talking about. It's like the sound design where it's so, I don't know, it's like the, the, the effects and the kills almost sound exaggerated in a way. Like the kills are like extra crunchy, extra juicy, extra brutal. This movie's got that 2000 sound design where things are just kind of loud. You know what I mean? And I'm here for it. I like it. I, I enjoy it. I like the sound design in this movie. And it fits also perfectly into the style that Rob Zombie's trying to put across on screen. This just abrasive, just menacing, dirty, loud movie. You know what I'm saying? And it fits pretty damn perfect. So 
Sound design is something that's also just very distinct in the franchise and I think is really, really enjoyable for me in the these two movies, um, definitely. Um, also in Halloween 1, I really like the idea. I like the idea a lot that they decided to kill Danny Trejo's character in this movie. So he's the security guard at, you know, at the jail hospital, whatever, um, where Michael is. And he's been watching him for like 20 years and taking care of him, you know, and being kind of kind to him and, you know, giving him respect and respecting his masks and things like that. I love the idea, though, that when they come face to face, Michael still kills him. I just think that was a brilliant idea to just give you even more of a look into the psyche of this character. I think that's just a great idea. Just something small I wanted to point out there, but I love that in this movie. That's just such a such a such a great little thing, you know. Um also, I mean, obviously we get a new Sam Loomis in this movie. It's uh Michael McDowell, uh Malcolm McDowell, excuse me, Malcolm McDowell playing Sam Loomis in this movie, who I actually think is a really good portrayal of a, a modern version of Sam Loomis in this movie, especially in H1 in a lot of ways. I'll talk about H2, obviously, but in Halloween 1, I think his character is, I think his character is great. Um, he doesn't do a ton early on in the movie or anything like that, but I just think as an actor, he does a really solid job, and uh, he's a good Sam Loomis in this these two movies for sure. So I enjoy his portrayal, Malcolm McDowell. Um, this movie also gives you some great Halloween vibes. Not every Halloween movie does that. Some Halloween movies are a little bit lacking in that area. And then you've got movies like Halloween 4, especially with the intro, that just give you those great fall Halloween vibes. And I think this movie, Halloween 1 here, uh, does a great job of that. It makes you feel like it's Halloween. It makes you feel like it's kind of cold and chilly. You want to put on a sweater. It's just that perfect time of year and uh, leading up to Halloween and, of course, Halloween night. So I think the Halloween vibes, that's a positive. Anytime you're mentioning Halloween movie, if they can pull that off. And I think in this movie, they do. I think they did a good job of that. So um, I will say definitely a bit of a criticism I have with um, with these movies is I do think it was a weird choice to make a character, uh, an actress, Daniel Harris, who is so beloved in this franchise and so well known as her kid portrayal in the franchise to make her the one getting naked a lot in these movies, somebody who is most well-known, like I said, for being the kid in the movies, was a little bit weird to me for that type of a choice. But, you know, great to see Daniel Harris back in the franchise. And, of course, hopefully we see more of her in the franchise in the future, which would be really cool. Love her, love what she does, and love everything she's done for, for horror. I think uh, Scout Taylor Compton as Laurie Strode in um, both of these movies, I think does a great job. I like Scout just in general. I think she's a good actress. Um, and especially in these movies, I really enjoy her portrayal of Laurie Strode. Um, I think she does a really good job playing the kind of, you know, innocent, goody two-shoes in a way girl who has a little bit of an edge to her too, you know? And um, I just think she does a great job as Laurie in both of these movies. And that's something to be said. You know, I got to point that out as a good too. And I also think in H1, I think the setting for the finale of the movie is great. Um, I think it's a great setting. It, it's so like gritty. It fits the tone of the movie and the tone of Rob Zombie's style so well. It's mean. It's nasty. It's just like when Michael's breaking the, the, the roof inside of the house, I feel like that just kind of encapsulates this movie in a way. It's just like, it's so dirty and loud and destructive and in your face, that moment where he's just constantly breaking the roof. I just feel like that encapsulates this movie and this these two movies in a way. And it's just such a good scene. And I just really like that finale at the end of H1. I think it's enjoyable. It's intense. It's it's gritty. It's bloody. It's keeps you on your toes thinking like what's going to happen here who's going to die you know it's it's a good finale in my opinion um so that's kind of h1 i enjoy h1 for sure um you know i've gone back and watched these movies when i first watched them there were times where i was kind of like ah do i like this part of it do i not like this part of it but in general i like h1 i think most of it yeah i, I would say i enjoy 
Uh, of course, the opening, you know, there's some parts that are a little bit mixed for me, but I get the reason why it's there, and I think it's effective. And for me, you know, I don't, I don't care if a movie is dark, depressing, or if a movie is lighthearted and, you know, comedic. You know, either one I'm great with as long as it's made well, it's scripted well, it's acted well, it's, you know, it's shot well. And I think the intro, you know, it's supposed to do something and it does a pretty good job with that. You know what I mean? So in general, just H1, I, I enjoy it. The funny thing is, is uh, Rob Zombie has told this story on some podcasts and stuff like that. But after seeing Halloween 1, Bob Weinstein called Rob Zombie up immediately. This was before it was released. He just got to see the final product. He calls up Rob, Rob Zombie and he says, you know, I hate every single fucking frame of this movie. And Rob Zombie's just like, okay. <laughs> and then right after the movie was released on, you know, Friday, whatever, when the sales were skyrocketing, they're adding more theaters. He calls him right back and he's like, I love every frame of this movie. <laughs> so um, the wine scenes, pieces of shit. But um, that was a story that Rob Zombie had shared about that, you know, and just also encapsulates the weird working relationship that he had with the Weinsteins, um, you know, just so hot and cold at times and just like, what's going on here, you know? And of course, they were more interested in money and their own their own prerogatives than giving a shit about anyone else, of course. But that's a, the Weinsteins, that's a topic for another day. On to Halloween 2. Ah, Halloween 2. Kind of the ultimate movie out of these two that, man, the peaks and valleys in this movie are crazy. And this is probably the movie that is the most polarizing out of these two on rankings lists that I've seen and other things just when people are talking about these movies because, like I said, there's things in this movie that people really really love and then there's other parts where they're just like what is going on here of course the dream sequence and of course the white horse stuff so halloween 2 so it's now time i guess to talk about the birth of hobo michael myers that we get to eventually see evolve and halloween ends right yippee but um you know when i first saw this movie i i thought it was weird the whole like michael traveling across as like a homeless guy you know without his mask in a sense he has his mask but he's not really like wearing it all the time i'm sure it gets sweaty you know it's it's ripped up but the ventilation isn't great i get it but that part i was always a little mixed on i've kind of come around on that part a little bit with halloween 2 but um yeah like i said rob zombie so the origin of halloween 2 kind of goes like this so other directors were hired on to do Halloween 2 because Rob Zombie refused to do it. After the experience of Halloween 1, he just didn't want to do it. It was a terrible experience. He's talked about it a million times. Hated it. But he had a three-film deal. So eventually, the Weinsteins, it didn't work out with the other directors to direct Halloween 2. So after firing like 10 of them, Rob Zombie eventually was like, all right, I've got a three-movie deal with you guys. If we can drop the third movie, I'll do the second Halloween movie and we'll just do two movies and then I'm out of my contract and I can just get rid of you guys and move on with my life. So he was like, okay. And up to this point, producer Malika Cod um, had started to gain some trust with Rob Zombie and enjoyed his working relationship with Rob Zombie. And um, at this point, kind of gave the keys, in a sense, to Rob Zombie a little bit. He wanted Rob Zombie to kind of move the franchise away even more than in the first Rob Zombie movie. He wanted to kind of let him move the franchise away from some of its established rules, I guess you could say, and kind of trusted him to come up with his ideas. And that's another reason he agreed to do the movie was because, you know, he was able to put a little bit more on his of his stamp on the movie and some more of his own ideas instead of having these kind of rules that he needed to kind of follow in the first movie. Because the first movie definitely feels more like a, you know, of course, like a remake. Definitely. It's got some tropes and things that we're used to, right? So, um, and of course, in this movie, we get the hospital scene. And if you've been following my channel for a little bit, you know I'm a sucker for hospital scenes in my horror movies. I love them. They're dark. They're scary. They're, they're just great. 
I love hospital settings, and this movie's no different. The dream sequence in this movie is amazing. Great kills, great moments. It's intense. It's raining. It's it's just great. It's amazing. Um, I love the hospital setting. It's a lot of times when you talk about these two movies, a lot of people say this dream sequence is by far their favorite moment in these two movies. And it's it's up there for me too. It might be my favorite, my favorite kind of moment out of these two movies as well. It's really, really good. So one of the one of the better moments for sure. So for me, when I first watched H2, I was like, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. So the hospital, we're starting this off. This is gonna be like a remake of Halloween 2. Lori Strode's, you know, she's beaten up for sure way more beaten up than Lori Strode in the original in some ways you know she's in the hospital this is starting to feel like a remake of Halloween 2 the original Halloween 2 and I'm I'm there for that one of my favorite horror movies ever made so I am down for that you know it went a little different of course and we'll talk about that but um I will say you know when we saw the new young Myers in this movie it's a little unfortunate um that they had to cast somebody new for this movie but you know, to play the young Myers um, outside of the original kid from H1. But um, for me, it doesn't really make or break the movie. This movie also, like, uses so much of Michael Myers' mom in this movie that it almost starts to veer a little bit into that Friday the 13th kind of area where they're using, you know, Pamela Voorhees a lot in the franchise. This movie almost starts to veer into that turret territory a little bit too much for me. I don't enjoy all of that stuff. I get they're kind of going with a little bit more of like an artsy approach with some deep themes and with the white horse and all that kind of stuff. You know, they give you that quote in the beginning to kind of let you know there's going to be some white horse stuff and this is kind of what it means. I don't know if that was added way later in production because they were like, nobody's going to understand what you're doing unless you add a paragraph at the beginning of the movie. I don't know, but maybe that's what they did. But yeah, a lot of mom stuff in the dead mom trope, prop, whatever you want to say. A lot of that in this, so kind of a little overused for me. Another thing to me in H2 that's overused is the dream stuff. You know, it's just kind of, in a way, it's a trope to add crazy sequences to your movie that don't really make much sense in kind of the timeline of the movie, in a way. Does that make sense? So... You know, you've got something going on. People are just doing something and oh, I'm just going to go to bed. And then boom, there's like this crazy sequence, which is fun to watch. But at times maybe was a little overused in this movie to me. Um, just that trope of implementing dreams to kind of make the movie crazier and, you know, more shocking and more gory and, and, and things. So, but um, of course, this movie is mainly you could say about following the trauma of Laurie Strode and just trauma in general, the after effects of when people have terrible things happen to them in their life. Obviously, these two movies are about the trauma that Michael Myers has experienced. But in H2, they also dive into, of course, Laurie Strode and her friends, Laurie, Laurie and Annie, you know, right? Especially their trauma that they've gone through and the after effects of that. And, um, and I think it's, it's pretty effective. I think Rob Zombie does a good job showing that, showing how people cope in different ways on, you know, having terrible things happen to them. You know, some people party, some people go this way, some people turn to God, some people do all kinds of things. So it shows, and I think that he did a pretty effective job showing that and showing the, the, the issues that it can cause for people. And we see Laurie Strode's journey and how she's kind of like going through life. And of course, eventually in this movie, she finds out that she's Michael Myers, the famous serial killer's sister. Like, you know, it's crazy and it's a lot. So that's interesting. And I think Rob Zombie does an effective job showcasing that in some ways. So a lot of this movie also is kind of, in my opinion, the story about kind of how humans have this fascination with watching a car crash. You know, why typically after a car crash, is a lot of the traffic backing up because we're rubbernecking. We want to see what happened. You know, we want to look like, oh, did somebody die or how bad is it? Or, you know, is everyone okay? What's going on here, right? And some of this movie has to do with that. We can't help but look at it, you know? And specifically with Dr. Loomis in this movie, it's about some people profiting off of terrible events and the after effects on how that affects the people 
who were really affected by these things, the families who had people who were killed, the families who are now going through the trauma of those events and the sadness and the depression of those events, now people profiting off of the car crash, profiting off of the terrible incidents, how that affects society and people in general, which is interesting. I think that was um, effectively done by Rob Zombie. I think he did a good job with that too. Um, so that's kind of interesting to me. I think for me, it kind of felt like they needed to explore. So I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, but the ending to the movie, of course, is one of the most polarizing moments of these two movies. And okay, so we're all, we're in this, you know, shack thing with Michael, with the ghost of young Michael, his mom, we're with Lori now because he captured Lori. And some of the stuff that's happening here, you know, is a little interesting to me, but I do feel like they needed to explore some of this stuff way more earlier on in the movie to make us A, care, and B, also just kind of like understand what's going on here. I felt like most of the movie was like Lori partying, Lori getting over her trauma, and then Michael just going ham on people. The huge dream sequence, all that kind of stuff. It really doesn't have a lot to do with what we see at the end. So I think if they put a little bit more time earlier on in the movie, more in H1 also exploring that potentially, I know that would have been hard because H2's idea might not have been conceptualized in H1 during that period, but still a little bit earlier on in the movie to make us understand and care more about what's happening at the end of the movie. So I'll talk a little bit about the theatrical ending and also the director's cut as well, but there's a few things here at the end of the movie um, as we kind of wrap up this video. So there's a moment where Lori in the theatrical cut of the ending says, I love you, brother. To me, cut that out. I think you should cut that out. I love you, brother. This might be a little bit of a nitpick, but I don't think we need to hear that from Lori. I think at that moment, just keep letting her kind of touch Michael's mask and kind of have that moment with him and let the audience, let us kind of come up with an idea of how she's feeling at that time. Obviously, there's a lot going on. Obviously, in her head, she's just, it's just a whirlwind. So cut out the I love you brother thing. I, I just don't think that should be there. I think it would have been way more effective if we could have thought about what she's kind of feeling there, in my opinion. So, you know, that's just something. And, you know, of course, in the theatrical ending, Michael, you know, gets killed. He and then Lori walks out with the mask and then falls to her knees, takes off the mask and then ends up in the mental hospital. And then we see the white horse and her mom kind of approaching her. And she's got like this sinister smile on her face. You know, there's not a lot there. It's just it's kind of pretty cut and dry. It's, you know, it's a, you know, a little bit confusing on the stuff in the in the shack. But but still. So. On to the director's cut. So I get in the director's cut why Michael talks. Obviously, one of the more controversial things in the franchise, definitely. And of course, before we saw Halloween Ends was up there. Definitely is probably a top three controversial thing in the franchise. Having Michael Myers talk when he says, die to, to Loomis, right? <laughs> but to me... I can understand, not necessarily enjoy it, but I can understand why that moment is there, right? The first two movies are all about how Michael came to be, in a sense. That's a big part of the first two movies, the origin of the evil behind Michael Myers. What's another part of the origin behind Michael Myers? That he was not necessarily a normal kid, but he was a kid who was like a talkative, you know, not necessarily talkative, but he was a kid who would talk. He would have conversations with his family and people at school and other things like that. He wasn't just a kid who was born and never spoke. So in the director's cut, bringing it full circle and having Michael Myers say something, you know, kind of fits these two movies. I do prefer, I would say, the theatrical ending. There's some things I don't like in the director's cut. I don't necessarily love having Michael's Michael talk, but I can understand why it's there. Because this isn't the timeline of 78 and the original H2 and blah, 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 blah. 
This isn't another timeline. This is Rob Zombie's two movies, and that's it. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, Michael didn't unlearn how to talk. He was around people talking. Dr. Loomis was talking to him for 20 plus years. So he just kept it in, you know? So I get why that's in there. Um, and, you know, I also don't mind at the end of the director's cut or the, yeah, the director's cut. I don't mind them killing Lori off at the end there, right? I just think, you know, she picks up the knife. She's standing over Loomis, who might still be alive. And, you know, the cops had to do what they had to do. It makes sense. And it also kind of shows, you know, the potential, ooh, does Lori have the same evil inside of her, you know? Which is also a little bit of a stretch because she was like an infant when all the trauma was happening. So then it would have to be more so like, okay, this is just based off of the trauma she had from being attacked from Michael Myers and also something that was just inherently evil in her. So a little bit of a different origin, I guess you could say, to, to Lori there. But I don't mind that, that, that aspect either to the director's cut. But like I said, I do prefer the theatrical cut just in general. So yeah, Halloween 1 and Halloween 2. Just these Rob Zombie's movies, Rob Zombie movies just have so many ups and downs things that i really enjoy the dream sequence the end of h1 and things that are kind of mixed for me the opening to h1 some of the white horse stuff you know the ending eh, a little bit mixed some of the things some of the way too many dream sequences in h2 mixed for me and then other things that are just you know i didn't talk about too many things that were really terrible in this movie um, because I'm a fan of this movie, you know, there are some things, like I said, I've already mentioned that I don't really like all that much. And I think could have been done more effectively and could have been done better. But overall, like I said, I actually am a fan of both of these movies. Maybe that's just because I'm a huge fan of Halloween in general, but I like Rob Zombie's take on these movies. Love the sound design. Love this Tyler main take on Michael Myers, this massive, scary character. These are definitely some of the scariest movies in the franchise, in my opinion. So I like these two movies. Yes, like I said, there's some things in them that are definitely questionable, but for the most part, I enjoy both of these two movies. So thanks so much for watching this long video, just kind of talking about the rise and fall of Rob Zombie's Halloween movies in the franchise. Appreciate you watching. Make sure you subscribe if you enjoy horror content, because there is plenty of that kind of stuff around here. Thanks so much for watching, everybody, and I will talk to you in the next one.